that level of commitment, see, intuitively you know, you know, it's like the guy that asked 50 girls down the street, will you go to sleep with me, will you go to sleep with me, eventually somebody's going to say yes. You don't want them to say yes because they're going to say, by the way, for this money, for your little doofus project, we want you to sign on the line, we want you to commit everything you own, etc., etc., and you're not willing to do that. That's why it irks me, pisses me off, and I say, well, where do I get money to make my business grow? You grab yourself by your crotch, and you go call on 300 banks. That's where you get the money. Not going to seminars, oh, where do I get money to make my business grow? If I figured out where to get the money, there's not a, a man or woman in this room that shouldn't be able to figure out where to get the money. You gotta suck up your pantyhose, go make, 500 cold calls and tell them that you'll risk everything in your life for this doofus project. That's why you don't get the money. I might as well be putting it upside down because you know you're going to call these people anyway. It doesn't make a shit. It doesn't make a shit. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't. Just remember, it doesn't matter what the morons say. I might as well put it upside down. <clears throat> now, does anybody have any questions about where you go get money from? You know, we ought to start a seminar. How to get money in the 90s, where to go, and how to do it. And we got a cartoon with a guy grabbing himself like this, <laughs> jumping from institution to institution. <laughs> <laughs> now, do the midgets talk like that? No. no. Can't jump like that. <laughs> yeah, they can. No matter how it, how easy it is, uh, easy it might be. Never accept short-term solutions to long-term problems. I've said this. I'm just going to say a couple more things. In 1982 and 1983, I ran out of money, and I was calling institutions, but I still ran out of money. And I came this close to selling 50% of my company for $250,000 in 1982, and 25% of my company. For $250,000, I got it wrong. 25% of my company, 10% of my company for $250,082, and $500,000 for 50% of my company in 1983. Because I was against it, had no, I ran out of cash. But I, I remember the story that Bob Guccione told me when he was trying to sell the uh, idea of Penthouse, Pen, uh, Penthouse Magazine. In the early 60s, he was sleeping on a bench in Hyde Park. He'd run out of money. And uh, he couldn't sell the idea to compete with Playboy. Everybody said he was nuts. And he sold half the idea of Penthouse Magazine for 1,000 pounds. At that time, 1,000 pounds was about $4,000. He went to the Grosvenor house. He got a room, took a shower, ate for the first time in two or three days. And then when he woke up th that next morning, he decided he had done something very bad. So he went around to the few friends he hadn't bummed money off of yet to get back to a thousand pounds and he went back to that person and he gave him back the thousand pounds. Three weeks later, he sold the idea to a group of investors in London and Penthouse Magazine was off and running and the rest is history. Short-term solutions to long-term problems. It's the easy way out. And almost always, not almost, always it's the wrong thing to do. Most people in business have historically run their business by making short-term solutions to long-term problems. It's easy. It's comfortable. It doesn't make you uneasy. It doesn't make you nauseous. It doesn't do any of those things that you have to do to be a high-performance person. A guarantor is a fool with a pen. 
I say that, but for every company in this room, I, I, unless your companies are bigger than, and I looked at all those numbers, the bank's always going to want you, almost always going to want you to be a personal guarantor. Always. And if you think any different, you're not going to grow. I was a personal guarantor until we were public one year. Because I always had deeper pockets than the company. When the company had $30 million in the bank, the bank let me off the hook. My company did, because the company was a guarantor. But, you know, prior to that, they didn't care. They always wanted me on the hook. So if you're not willing to do that, then at this level, unless you get a joint venture partner. Now, what should be coming, um, hopefully, obviously clear to you is the partnering up. You're able to spread and limit some of these, these risk factors that make your private shrink up. Somebody's private just fell off. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't say whose private it was. I mean, so it should become obvious to you that the reason that a lot of people join venture is to diffuse this 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 challenge, this problem that we have of getting over the fact of laying all our life on the line. Whether you're, it's a lot easier when you're 26 than when you're 36 or when you're 46, because your perception is that you got a few assets. Okay. Now, I want to talk about internal growth. <clears throat> I've asked questions, I've talked to most of you one-on-one, uh, -on -one. I've looked at your confidential uh, forms you filled out. And I'm going to make a quantum leap here, but I can't see anybody in this room growing exponentially internally. Not one single solitary person that's got their ass on a chair in this room today. Not one. There's only one slide in the internal growth part of this seminar because I can almost always say that. Because it's a fact of life. Because you don't generate enough internal cash flow to be grow geometrically. You just don't. And the only alternative is it's external. Uh, where's the, uh, the mic? We gotta get a midget named Mike to run up and down these deals. Dan, can you explain that to me? I'm not as... No, I am, I am. I was just, you know, I was uh, pausing for a, you know, like a, a great Shakespearean actor before I bust out and rip your face off, you know. <laughs> Okay, you got a business, whether it does $100,000 a year or $10,000 a year, or excuse me, $10 million a year, and you've got, you know, your revenue less your, your costs, and you come up with some sort of margin, and then you come, most of you don't have after-tax profits, because one of the reasons that you can't grow internally is because you're milking your business to death, you're sucking the blood life. What are you smiling for, Craig? <laughs> You're sucking the lifeblood out of your businesses because you don't want to pay taxes. And, you know, and so if you ever try to sell your business, they think it was a piece of shit because it's not making any money. And then you say, well, if you back off this and the nine cars I bought and, and put back my house and, and the fact that I paid for the sprinkler system out of the company in my house, <laughs> and I, you back, then I really made a million dollars. Well, people don't do that, guys and gals. They don't back off and add back and do all that crap. They just don't. Either do banks. And that's why I said early on in the first or the second day to run your businesses like you were going to go public. They're more readily financeable. And then by, by, if by some stroke of God that you could take it public, then you don't have to go back up and re, uh, bogus up the numbers for the last five years. But virtually everybody that own, runs a privately held business does just the opposite. 
When I was building Great Western, I did just what I just said. I ran it always like it was a public company. I always had audited financials that I couldn't afford. And then when it came time, when the opportunity was there, I could jump on it like stink on a skunk. And I was able to do it in three and a half months because we didn't have to go back and make up all the numbers for the last five years and pay the company back for all the crap you bought your wife and all this other crap everybody does. You cannot grow internally based on the conversations you had virtually, I don't think anybody in this group, geometrically to get where those goals, and some of them are three or four hundred million dollars. It's just, it's just not possible. It just isn't. There's not enough years in your lifetime. There just isn't unless we're, we're living to a thousand years or twelve hundred years or something I believe in compounded interest rates I do but I mean it transcends the compounded interest rates it just does so by definition people call me an acquisition guy it's not so much because I'm an acquisition guy it's because I, it's the only way I can figure out to grow quickly now the energy business drill, drilling oil was is one of those businesses you can grow exponentially internally but you gotta find oil and I found soon on I didn't know how to do that. It took me about four or five months of drilling dry holes. I mean, it was like a light bulb, instantaneously. So then, vis-a-vis -vis internal growth, at the beginning when you start your businesses, you can have that exponential growth because you're coming from zero. But once you get up the cycle, anything, anything, uh, you know, uh, above a few hundred thousand dollars or whatever the number is it's not possible it just isn't that's why excuse me Craig I'll get to you in a second that's why most people are satisfied with arithmetic growth because by definition for exponential growth you have to do something you don't understand most people don't understand exponential growth because they don't understand how you get there and it means that you have to do joint ventures you have to do business in a way that you haven't been trained. And that's the honest to goodness reason why most people stay small to medium sized companies. Because again, it's their comfort zone. They're, to do anything different would force you out of your comfort zone. Force you out of what you've been doing for one, two, five, twenty, thirty years. You've got to go do something different. And that different thing will make you feel uncomfortable and make you nauseous and all the things we've talked about. Yes, Craig. Most uh, small to medium-sized privately held companies that I'm familiar with don't really have a professional board of directors. And I was wondering... That's correct. I mean, they got their brother-in-law or their wife's on it, and I'm included in this group. And I was wondering uh, what your opinion of that is. And okay. That's a good question. The... Um, by the way, one of the ways that you get, you, you surround yourself with, uh, uh, to attract high performance people are to have boards. But you gotta pay people to come on boards. Most of you have boards, you don't pay anybody anything. And you get what you pay for. You pay them nothing, you got a mooch. <laughs> it's that simple. Which it comes in the form of your, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, it comes in the form of your wife, your brother-in-law, your, your sister. I mean, it's just that simple. Remember I told you I bought that UK company in 1980, whenever I did, because it had a board. I needed, I needed a company in England like I needed AIDS. I didn't. But I, it would take me years to put that board together. So I just went, you know, and I bought it. It wasn't a big company, but it had the right board on it. It was prestigious, and I bought it. And then I, you know, I used that board. Then I formed a whole organization around it. What I would suggest is that you find in the initial stages two or three people that can be a board and, and, and not so much uh, a mastermind group or anything like that. You can find people like that. You have to pay them. I mean, most private companies, uh, board members, may, uh, except for the huge companies, they, they, they pay them ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year to attend, you know, a half a dozen meetings plus their travel expense. Now, see, most of you would rather cut your toes off than do that. Well, I'm going to pay an idiot $15,000 a year, four idiots, $15,000 a year to come to four meetings a year. You wouldn't do that. And when 
probably another three or four thousand dollars in expenses per person. So that's why most private companies don't have boards. And if you're gonna have a board, you ought to have audited financials because, I mean, what's the board gonna look at? Your internal stuff that was put together by your cousin? So, I mean, it's, it, 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 I, but Craig brought up a good point. I think you should have boards. I had a board early on, from the very beginning. And one of my board members sitting in the back of the room there, that guy that's as old as Methuselah back there on the left-hand <laughs> corner. Another board member is sitting next to him, the one with a shit-eating grin that's hoping that you give him money to invest at Bear Stearns. I mean, they're two of my original board members from years and years ago. Damn. Yes, well, Mike, Mike for the kid. Well, you're not a kid anymore anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Was a kid, but now I'm nice. 40-something, but... Still a kid, 40-something, right? I'll just add uh, that it is not mandatory that you have to pay these people, too, when uh -huh. you get them on well, your board early on. Yeah, early you on. Find yeah, them I haven't paid these guys early on. He's right. He's right. He's right. He's right. He's absolutely correct. I didn't pay him. The, uh, but you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody as good as I did. Maybe you will. Uh, I say that because it's easier to get them and, uh, if you pay them. But, uh, and I assure you, if you ask either one of them, you're going to have to pay them now. <laughs> it wasn't like 15 plus years ago. Um, but boards can help you. And again, then you want to pick somebody on the board that really, that you want to be around, that is where you're not. You don't want to pick a bunch of guys you went to college with and, I mean, you're defeating the purpose. You want to pick somebody. Uh, Mike, for Bruce, please. In uh, picking the board, did you give equity to the board of directors? No. When I went public, I gave options, but I didn't give equity at that time. Uh, now, I'm doing it now, I'm giving equity. But I wasn't as smart, you know. I'm lucky I bumped into some people who had confidence in me uh, early on in my career, but now I give equity. When I, have, when I form um, board members, now I give equity away. And if you're going to pick two or three people, what, uh, what are the best talents in those two or three people? I'd pick one from the accounting field, one from the legal field, and one from uh, the general business. And if you're going to have more than that, then I have somebody that's got Wall Street background. But accounting and legal are probably the first two. And I throw all my relatives off unless you're worried about a vote on the board, but if you own all the stock or most of the stock because you're not going to give any away, I mean, it doesn't much matter. You can always get rid of the board. You're the largest shareholder, just throw them out. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not a big problem. Any more questions on that? Okay. By definition, Internal growth is, most of you grow internally, not, a, not real internally, because when you borrow money, to me, that's not growing internally. You tall it internally because you don't have to give up any equity or anything. But, I mean, it's really external growth when you're borrowing money from financial institutions. Because, now, you can overcome this internal growth quandary if you generate enough revenue. Revenue generation, again, not cost control. You can never experience hyper growth, quantum leaps in business without generating a lot of revenue. You can get past this idea of internal growth if you can generate enough revenue. I mean, a lot of revenue. Most people don't fall into that category where they're generating enough revenue. Because with enough revenue, you can get banks to do special things, you know, but most of the people aren't generating enough revenue. Uh, Mike for Mr. Legrand. Ron. Ron, Ron. If you uh, generate enough revenue, why do you need the banks? Because, well, uh, the reason I still use the banks, even though I generated a lot of revenue, is because I wanted to even grow faster. See, uh, you know, if I was growing at 50% a year, I wanted to grow at 300% a year. So what did you spend the money on, to acquire more companies? Uh, well, no. I spent, I spent the money on acquiring more companies and 
I spent the money on paying my people more money. Someday, sometimes I borrowed money to pay my people bonuses. Perception is reality. I assure you they don't care where the money came from when you pay them the bonus. Is that true? Uh, you, uh, true. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's kind of like a, the, the, the doofus question. Duh. I mean, yeah. I borrowed money. I yeah, yeah. That's two of your two of your team there both said, good thing I brought up, huh? Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, we got that squared away. Yeah, and so, um, but unless. Oh, well, it's it's very rare that I've ever seen a company that can create enough revenue, unless you know they've they've got a lock on some end of the computer market or something where their 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 revenue just explodes, uh, you know, off 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 the charts. Um, and, and and whether you need debt or not, there's so many companies that I look at that really don't have a banking relationship. A banking relationship, ladies and gentlemen, is a line of credit. That you can call your little moron bank or say, send me 50, 100, 5 million, whatever it is. If you don't have a line of credit with your business, you don't have a banking relationship. What you've got is a deposit relationship. And a doofus hooker off the street can get a deposit relationship. Most people I talk to don't have banking relationships. They have deposit. They take your money, they give you some measles. Uh, miserly interest rate back on it. If you want to borrow money, you put up a CD dollar for dollar. <laughs> That's where most of you stand. If you're that good. You need a banking relationship to grow. And you need, as I said earlier, you need a bank that can take you to the next level. The founder, the CEO, the boss, should think nothing, have nothing in his mind or her mind other than generating revenue, exposing yourself to new deals and new transactions. Should do nothing else. The Verdiers, all they do is travel now. One, because George can't stand to sit in his office without screwing around with his computer, printouts of, of, of his revenue and costs and stuff. Burl doesn't even go to the office anymore, do you, Burl? Doesn't even go to the office. When I want her, I call her at home or, you know, she's traveling. Leanne or somebody told me, talk to your sister and your sister knows how to get a hold of her. Now, this is a woman that used to choke the people in her office to death. She doesn't even go to the damn office anymore. And business has boomed, shall we say. And, that, you know, and, I, and again... I told her, I said, you get, if you leave these people alone and that you hired a general manager, didn't you, or something like that? If you leave these people alone and you put a, one or two key people in there, this thing will make so much money and boom so quickly, it'll make you, it'll scare you. And that's exactly what's happened. Because we're the problem. The problem is here and it's us. We're the one that everything up. It's not those guys that work for us. It's us. That's a hard thing to admit. That's a tough turd to swallow. The problem is here and it's us. And it is, believe me. I don't know, I, guess I could have brought in five or 10 more people to say the same thing. I'm not paying these people, they're not lying, uh, you know. It's the truth. Penism. All managerial performance sins shall be always be forgiven during periods of rapidly increasing revenue streams. Always. You can never have too much revenue. I made some of the, the, the most horrific managerial mistakes in my career. But when, you know, when revenue went from five million a month to 10 million a month to 50 million, it didn't matter. Banks didn't even care. Dan screwed up, he shouldn't have bought that drilling company. He's fine, dump it, blow it out. <laughs> banks will sit, tell you, next time we'll get it right, won't we, Dan? The banks will tell you. Uh, 
it's you know like I said the most important personal problem you've got with your, your individuals is money it all evolves around money just think as individual entrepreneurs how much time we think we've wasted in my judgment wasted and hopefully by today you will agree it's wasted on pencils and I'm being this slightly tongue-in-cheek when I say this pencils bedding paper car leases equipment horse shit I mean, just think all the time. How much equity should I give them? How much shouldn't I? How do I get it back when they, well, you know, when I got to fire them or I catch them stealing? <laughs> it all means nothing. Just, but just think about all the time that we spend doing that. You know? Like, I, I have a friend of mine who's got a daughter. He's always, she's 16 years old, very attractive, and she looks like she's 25. He, he, all his waking hours and half of his sleeping hours, are, God, I wonder if she slept with somebody. I wonder if she's taking drugs. I mean, this guy's, in, 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 way, nothing he can do about it. She's either, he's either set the, the, the characteristics for her, or set up the foundation for her character, or she ha he hasn't by now. Nothing he can do about it now. Yeah, but he wastes a lot of time thinking about it. And, and I'm here to tell you that most of the things you do, in fact, I, I'm going to be bold. Of course, I'm not usually bold. <laughs> no. 95% of every working day, what you do in your office, in your business, if you never did it, it wouldn't mean spit. You've got people in your, to those, for those of you that have employees, you've got people in your organization that can do it better than you. Some of your people can do it infinitely better than you, and you ought to get out of that damn way. Right, Burl? Right. People ask, you know, somebody made the comment, well, Burl was already rich when, she met, when he met Dan. He had a few bucks, I mean... And, and well, she, her, her net worth's only gone up three or four hundred percent, roughly speaking, right? And she's working less, but she's working at what she does best. And these other people do it better, the other stuff. And that's all I did. That's all I did. I mean, this is no great genius. But 95% of your work day is a waste of time. So you think about what could you be doing that out of 95? You know, get a girlfriend or do something. Just, I mean, have some fun in life, you know. My wife doesn't like when I say, get a girlfriend, get a mistress, get a you know, boy. I mean, you know, she doesn't like to hear that. But do something. I mean, do something productive with your time. Instead of in there bugging the employees, screwing things up. The, the, the CEO, the entrepreneur, the founder of the company should be a glad-handing son of a bitch that just walks around shaking his, Hi, my name's Joe Dufus. I found a company. Wendy's, the chairman, the former chairman of Wendy's, that fat moron that does the commercials. That's all he does. <laughs> Hi, my name's Joe That's all you should do. Saw one of your seminars. <laughs> yeah. What's that moron's name? Yeah. Oh, I wonder if you did it. I love that guy. <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> you know? Now, the company, when they bought him out, that was smart thinking what they did. Of course, the last few years, I'm told that's all he did. I mean, the senior manager said, hey, you got to get out of here, Dave. I mean, you're screwing the business up. We're going to try to pump this baby up like a show dog and pump it out to somebody, but we need you out of the door to do it. And that's what happened. So what happened? He, he sold it. So, they sold it. Who they sell to? Pardon? He's still a large shareholder. Yeah, but who, who's the major shareholder now? Uh, somebody, but I mean, Pepsi. Pepsi or somebody. I mean, 
he got out of the way. Okay. And our external growth, and this is what some people say, the only thing I know anything about, which I don't believe is true, but perception is reality. Um, I determined six months into my public life as a public CEO or CEO of a public company that I didn't know anything about successfully in an economic fashion finding oil. And in fact, Mr. Orman's nephew, who was on my board, a gentleman, a very bright guy named Wayne Phelan, who was a very bright petroleum engineer, who's still on the board of Great Western, came to me, and because, or actually I came to him and I said, am I reading these numbers right? He says, yeah, Dan, I, we got to sit down and talk about this, because the reserves that we thought were there weren't there in the, in the DJ Basin. And he says, we're going to run out of money in between 15 and 19 months, and we'll be out of business in 20 months. I said, well, good. We just had a public offering. We just raised a ton of money to drill all these wells up there. So we're in a board meeting, and I'm sitting down, and um, I made an instant decision. We are now going to be an acquisition team. Notwithstanding, we don't have all, a lot of acquisition guys on here, but we're going to become an acquisition team because I'm going to take this $10 million that we raised from the public, and we're going to do acquisitions. And the first acquisition we made was Whitaker Corporation, which is a Fortune 500 company here in Los Angeles. Uh, and we, we bought out their oil subsidiary in, in uh, June of 1985. But anyway, so, but I instantly understood that we didn't have enough money. I could read the, the charts, or ha Wayne helped me read the charts, and I could figure out that the oil wasn't there. We had the, one of the finest petroleum engineers in the country tell us that it was there. We raised money on it. City, I mean, everything was done right, but it wasn't there. It's not an exact science. Now we could have continued to drill, drill wells, and I could have continued to not want to swallow my pride and go begging on my knees to the shareholders, which I had to do, which I did many times. The CEO, the entrepreneur, is the one that's got to go begging when things go wrong. And God knows, I, I got calluses all over these knees. They're a little softer now because I haven't had to go begging recently, but it'll happen again. And we changed investment dis uh, our investment direction just, we made a quantum leap. We're doing, we had just, I just made like 60 presentations to institutions, tell them we were going to do this. In August of 84, and in October 84, I changed my mind. I just flipped around, and we're walking this way now. <laughs> and I still remember Governor Hugh Carey, God bless him, he stands up, and, and I also cut salaries 40%. I, I take, took all the cars away from everybody, expense accounts away from everybody, everything. And Hugh Carey and Bruce Patterson, uh, Hugh Carey, former governor of New York, Bruce Patterson, former treasurer of Royal Dutch Shell, got up and they both made impassioned speeches about this is a bad precedent to set for the shareholders, to show them how wrong we could have been. Now, I own 60% of that public company at that time. This, was, this is Dan. Every dollar I spent, I looked at 60 cents of my dollar. And Charlie and Mark own 15%. So we, as far as we were concerned, the shareholders only owned 25 cents every dollar here. So it's our money. So we said, we're going to flip it around. We're going to change. And I cut salaries and threw everybody's car, got, took it away. And we decide, got, decided to go on the acquisition train because we could not grow. I, I had been given a mandate. And basically, ladies and gentlemen, your mandate, in my judgment, is to grow your company as fast as humanly possible. If not, you, shouldn't, you don't have to go to work every day. If you if, if if going to work every if you have to go to work every day to maintain your company just so it stays where it is today, then something's wrong with it. You ought to get rid of it, fall under a bus, or do something. I mean, so my mandate was that to grow a company geometrically. So I said the shareholders don't care how I do that as long as I do it. So I decided instantly that we were going to do it by external growth, and by external growth, that meant ultimately debt and making acquisitions. Now, we've already gone through the names where you can go borrow money all over the country. It's not that hard. In fact, it's, it's almost like opening the yellow pages and going down and just making three appointments a day. Get your good business plan. You can do it on Lotus. Well, I don't know if Lotus 1, 2, 3 has got a business. But you got software to do business plans now, pretty sophisticated ones. And you pack about 40 of them in your car, 
and you just start pounding the streets. For those of you that aren't willing to do that, then you wasted your money coming here. Yeah. Oh. Mike, 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 for Mr. Hoffman. Mike. <laughs> huh? You don't, you, you don't obviously believe in when, when a company goes out of business and somebody says, well, they, they just grew too fast. That's, no. That's, that's what happened. No. That's an excuse. They went out of business because of mismanagement. I've never seen a company that grew too fast. They went out of business because they grew too fast. I've only seen companies that were mismanaged. Because you've got to be able to manage rapid growth. And managing 25, 50, 100% growth a year is a lot different than managing 2% growth. Big difference. Big difference between not playing to win and, not, and playing not to lose. Big difference. And that's why I said joint ventures, you got to find somebody. You can grow geometrically, exponentially without somebody that's been there. It's harder. It's not impossible. But if you're willing to make the mistakes along the road, then you can do it without, on your own. Make a lot of mistakes. Make a lot of decisions. Open a lot of restaurants that fail. Open a few that are super successful. Yes, sir. When you look for businesses, should they be associated associated types of your business or just anything? No. My, well, I used to think anything, but I don't anymore because I lost, you know, like I said, I'm $40 million down here in the last few years. No. I believe they should be, have some uh, be at least ancillary some sort of some. tangential relationship so there and I don't like to use this word so there's some synergism uh, I'm not sure I know what that means but I know everybody uses it so there's some synergism I don't like you know businesses are way off in the you know in Lapland and the uh, right now because I'm in the fire resistance business uh, making fabrics by uh, molecular changing the changing the molecular structure we're looking at other things that are related to fire protection, fire resources. Well, that's the name of the company, Fire Resources, because they can be all kind of wrapped up together. Because I'm in the what I call the business success coaching business, we're looking at the things that are, you know, books, tapes, TV, that are, you know, have something to do with that. Uh, Mike, for the young man over here. Uh, you alluded to several times about how you change the relationship around when you see a banker. You mm -hmm. don't go at them the conventional way. Because so far, I've only heard the conventional type way. How do you how do you turn it around in terms of you're coming to them asking for something that their attitude? How do you make? Okay, uh, that's a good question. We're going to use Burl for an example. One example. I'll, I'll try to give a couple more. When I first met Bur Burl, I had already told you that she had never been turned down by the Royal Bank of Canada in 25 years, which I was stunned. I, I think I almost fell over when she told me. And I said, well, you're obviously not asking for anywhere near enough money, for starters, I mean. So the, when, you, when, when, you're, when you're getting ready to, to change your relationship with your bank, first of all, most of you are dealing with a bank you shouldn't deal with, so I wouldn't be wasting my time changing the relationship with the, the doofus bank you're already doing business with. I'd go find me a bank that that you, can take you to the next level. So everything I'm about to say, don't unless you're dealing with already a huge bank that can do that, uh, just you're going to use this on somebody else. The banks basically in today's environment want deposit relationships and they're forced to do debt relationships but everybody's scared from what happened in the 80s so to, to sweeten the pie like i just renewed a loan that i had i rolled over for another two years not because i couldn't pay it off but because i wanted to maintain the relationship with the bank i wanted him to be able to be happy and i know that he was charging me three over prime which i'm big enough i don't have to pay three over prime but i wanted to set him up for the next time i need to use him so I roll this, you know, this loan over, paying interest when I don't have to. That's one of the first things, pay interest when you don't have to. Second thing is, don't, don't, don't bitch and complain about fees and stuff like that. 
If the difference between one over prime and three over prime kills your deal, forget the deal, shit can it. I mean, you shouldn't have to. I mean, the deal shouldn't be that tight. If you're in a deal that that's tight, that tight, that means there's no margin for any mistakes whatsoever. And we already know you're going to make mistakes, and we already know the doofuses that work for you are going to make mistakes. So you've locked yourself into a recipe for failure. If the deal's so tight, the difference between one and three over prime makes a difference. Something's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Because you're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. So if I make mistakes, God knows everybody else is. Okay, so don't argue about the fees so much, you know. Tell the guy or the gal that you, you're, you know, you're changing banks because you've outgrown this bank. This bank can't take you to the next level. Everybody hears that. And it's true a lot of times. It's important to leave your other bank on a good relationship. Not that, you know, that the guy's bad mouths you when the guy calls and says, you know, a way to do that is leave a little money in the bank. Because he knows when you leave that little money in the bank and you're taking your banking relationship away, there's only one reason you're leaving that money in the bank. Come Maybe. No. You're leaving that money in the bank because to soothe the cut around his throat you just did <laughs> and he'll appreciate that and he'll talk so good about you oh this guy this guy is a prince among men and instead of this slayed on his lawn blah, 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 blah. okay that's that's how you start now see and, and you're doing something that this is against conventional wisdom why would I leave any money with these pricks when I'm not going to do business with them anymore because you don't want them to cut your throat that's why now, when you're big and you're moving 80, 100, 400 million dollars, you can do that. But nobody in this room has fallen into that category, you know. I called the president of um, Chemical Bank and I said, uh, I wish we had the kind of t uh, phones where you could tell, uh, I, you know, the TV screens, so you could see this. I'm taking my 85 million dollars out of your bank and I hope you're rotten hell. But, I mean, I'm not suggesting you do that. <laughs> I'm not suggesting, you know. So that's for starters. Secondly, you you come to him with a cogent, intelligent, well thought out business plan, and you don't even have to be that smart. You can do this on software. They got all kinds of software now. I'm told. I don't know how to do it myself, but I know you can put together a business plan, a fairly copious one. I mean, in not too much time. Plug in the numbers, and they they pump them out instead of the, on the back of a yellow pad. And I mean, like Burl does. But Burl's got a lot more money than most people in this room, and she's got a track record of 20 years of doing this. Big difference. Okay. Next, you always ask for three to five times more of a line of credit. First of all, I'm coming here because I need a, a line of credit. I don't need some place to hold my deposits. I can do that in my tin can in my backyard. And for the interest rate you're giving me, I might as well keep my money in my tin can in the backyard. You're going before a relationship. That's a great word. They like I want to build a, a strong relationship because it's now called relationship banking. Hey, Jim, do they still call it relationship banking? Yeah. Yeah, it's a doofus term if I ever heard one. Some MBA moron came up with that deal. Because I want to build a relationship because I'm going to be here long term. You're going to be here long term until they stop funding your deals and you're going to go someplace else. But you don't need to tell them that. That's long term to you until they stop funding your deals. Then you're, I mean, like, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. So you, you, you're asking for three to five times what you want. They'll agree on some number that's probably, a lot of you don't even have lines of credit. So, I mean, they'll agree, they'll, they'll ultimately agree on some number that's you know, infinitely more than you think you can use. You always want a line of credit much larger than you think you can use. And then, believe me, I, I'll show you, you know, you'll learn how to use it. Because what you want is you want the ability, when a deal comes to you, you can commit to it. And the, one of the reasons that we were able to go, additional reason we were able to grow so fast, is I was able to make commitments like this. Because I knew I could put the interim financing together myself through my own cash and lines of credit. And then I could go put together permanent financing later. On a smaller scale, you can do the same thing.
banks don't want to hear that you're going to grow at 11 percent a year contrary to what you might have been told banks want to believe that you're going to grow at 50 percent a year because in the initial stages where most of these businesses are if you're not going to go at 30 50 percent a year something's wrong you know something is definitely wrong for those of you that run more seasoned business you know you can take some of that away but they still they want you know if i were craig hoffman i'd go and say i plan on starting a chain that in three years is going to have a hundred stores you know and i'm assuming this so i don't know if it's true i run profitable well well managed blah, blah, blah. you know this is the bottom line on these these stores uh use one store as a model obviously your best store as a model i can make a hundred of these cloned He's already done it once, as they say in Texas. So the bank will believe, short of other, you know, some other, some other rationale, that he should be able to do it. And these are the, the 25 cities I'm going to do it in. Now, he's already got a track record of running successfully for a number of years. For those of you that have no track record, you're going to be, they're going to be asking for the equity in your house. You're going to have to you're going to have to sign. And if you're not willing to do that, then you can't you're not going to be able to grow. That's why joint venture partners or giving up equity, big chunk equity, doesn't matter. In the first couple of deals I made 90 grand and 50 million dollars on my deal with Legette. I don't know, we did $20 million in business and maybe, maybe I made a couple hundred thousand dollars. I don't remember now, it's been a long time ago. But, just a moment. But the idea is, when you have a, a, a um, track record of transactions, the banks and financial institutions and the joint venture partners and all the other people that I've alluded to for the last two and a half days are more readily and willing and able to get comfortable with giving you what you need. Yes. You said shopping a lot of different banks. How do you avoid the credit reporting? You know, if, if you've got 20 re reports that you're shopping for money, does that affect you um, negatively? No, it never did me. I mean, uh, I shopped all over the United States, all over the world. I mean, so, uh, I, you know, it's something I never worried about. It never affected me. It just, you know, it just never did. Uh, it was always more important to me to get the money than it was what the other bank that I, you know, I could always explain away. It never happened to me, but I mean, I could always explain away. Well, I mean, this, they ran nine TRWs or whatever the words are. I said, yeah, well, you know, I, I've made nine presentations. This op business opportunity is going to go away in a few weeks if I can't fund it. So and I can't wait every doofus bank. I mean, I've got to go through the credit committee and the this committee and that committee. The bank will understand. A bank will understand. See, you, you you know you're thinking of ways why it shouldn't be done or it can't be done. I mean, you're you know you come up with a lot more obstacles than banks do. And again, it gets back to because you're not as comfortable with your deals as you think you are. You're not as willing to to make those major commitments. See, I and I said it the first day. Ta bless you. Talking about being successful is cocktail talk of the 90s, you know? It's like when you were 12 or 13 years old and you talked about sex, you hadn't gotten laid yet, you know? It just, it's the thing to do when you're 12 or 13. When you're a boy, look at Playboy or whatever you used to look at. And if you're not willing to do that, I mean, and all the grandiose things that I can talk about that have worked, you know, and all the half a dozen people that we've talked to up here that are testimonial to, you know, that, that it works, at the end of the day, you, you still have to be willing to pay that price to action and make that commitment. Okay. Did I answer your question about the banks? Okay. Any other questions? so far does everybody understand how what I'm talking about applies to them
Okay. Now. Right here. I have one little. Oh, uh, ma'am. This isn't exactly on the track, but it has to do with borrowing money. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know how you managed to get 11% financing, 1100% of financing on that castle. I put up, um, how many millions of dollars, let me think. I put up collateral outside the bank, outside the actual castle and the grounds and the estate. Uh, that more than amply covered the, the 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 coverage that they wanted. That's how I got 11%, 100%. Guarantee that. Oh, I guarantee. I have. I've had to guarantee every single thing I've ever had. When I when I when I borrowed 120% of my Houston house, I guaranteed it. I mean, it goes without saying. You know, most of you aren't willing to do that. And if you're not willing to do it, then, you know, then a lot of what I've talked about, most of what I've talked about, you won't be able to accomplish. Somebody once asked me at a speech when I was, I was just whipping the crowd. This was in Baltimore, Maryland. I was just whipping them like a dog because I was really pissed off because they were asking stupid questions. And uh, there were 65 CEOs. About half a dozen were women. And somebody asked me, said, um, Mr. Pena, I said, uh, how much of what your success uh, would you base on brains and how much on balls? Good question. Anybody want to guess how I answered it? Uh-uh, no, 50-50. 50-50. And, and, and it wasn't, you know, and actually in hindsight probably 70-30 or 80-20, I mean brains versus the other. And because when you're really committed about something, you actually believe it's going to work. Ladies and gentlemen, see, the trouble is your deals, you don't actually believe they're going to work. There's a big difference. I know mine will work. You only think maybe perhaps on the 29th of February in the year 2006, you know, if a star hits you, yours will work. There's a big difference. And the reason my do work and Rick Scott's work is because they believe. Rick believes. Rick believes he's going to control, you know, by God he is. Little skinny doofus that he is, you know. But if you don't believe, you know, at one time, I, I don't know if everybody did believed in Santa Claus, but I know I did. And I believed in Santa Claus until I was 11 years old. You know? And, and, and... Uh, I wanted to believe, my kids don't believe in anything, you know, they believe in, uh, they believe in dollars and cents and pounds sterling, that's all my kids believe in, but if you don't believe in it enough, you know, if you're that kid in the sandlot, throw it to me, throw it to me, if you don't believe your hands are going to catch the ball, by God you won't. Self-esteem is the basis for excellence in business you know all the rest comes after if you don't believe if you're experiencing no anxiety or discomfort the risk you are taking probably isn't worthy of you the only risks that aren't a little scary are the ones you've outgrown a high comfort level provides solid evidence that you're playing it safe, not growing, not really testing your limits at all, and not in the process of a quantum leap. I knew he was going to get up there for this right, one. Boss, I gotta get okay, I know how this, this one, this one is a heavy duty one. This is a good one. But see, I think you're all heavy duty. See, that's the difference. I think everything I say is dynamite. As you goddamn right I am. I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask my. I'm gonna. Well, Linda will be here. She, she she said if you ask me to say that again, I'm gonna say no, Dan. I'm gonna tell him a different story. So I'm not gonna ask her. She says I don't like you putting me on the spot and making me say that. I'm not making you. It's just, it's true. But I we don't need to tell everybody in Southern California. If if you're experiencing no anxiety, some people in this room haven't felt anxiety since the last time you asked your first date out. 
The risk you're taking probably isn't worthy of you. The only risks that aren't a little scary are the ones you've outgrown. A high comfort level provides solid evidence you're playing it safe, not growing, not really testing your limits at all, and not in the process of a quantum leap. It's natural to want to be in the tummy of the kangaroo, the mommy, you know, and they're nice and warm and cuddly. But that's not how you grow a business. In battle, it's a lot, a lot easier to sit on the bottom of the foxhole, you know, watching the things go over your head. It's a lot easier than popping your head up. It's a lot safer. Not many battles won that way. Uh, uh, in revenue volume before you go public, dude. No, it, well, it depends on the industry, but I mean, um, <laughs> I've heard people say you have to be up to like 50 million before they start to look at you and stuff. No, right? you can be public on uh, because we're at the top of the uh, the bull market. There's uh, you can go public on regional exchanges. I mean, uh, Denver Exchange, the over-the-counter market. Uh, there's no, that's not really true. Um, if you want a, a, a listing on a major exchange and you want to be brought public by a major New York investment house, then you're going to have to be a fairly sizable company. Uh, I'm not sure 50 million is big enough. It might be 100 million. Yeah, if, uh, yeah no, if, no, if you want to be on the, uh, the major NASDAQ or um, American stock exchange, you're going to have to have a pretty large company. But there are little, you know, $10 million revenue companies that go public all the time. I know a guy uh, I know out in Calabasas here that just took uh, last year. He makes um, those DC carpets. Uh, <laughs> ink uh, these the cartridges for laser printers. He makes cartridges. He's got one contract with um, Simmons. Who is this? I don't know. Lorraine, what's that guy's name out there? What okay. city? What city? Calabasas. Because Calabasas. that's the industry I'm in. That's why I thought of it. I read the and forms you fill out, you know. I'm not like, everybody collects these forms and then uses them for toilet paper. I actually read the, the doofus remarks you put down. Wait, do you, you have the name? We can find out the name. Yeah. He, he went public? He went public last year. He does six or seven million dollars of revenue. And he went public with some little company called, uh, huh? He's in Agora or Calabasas, yeah. He has, he has a major contract with Simmons, and it's a month-to-month -month contract. It's a month-to-month. -month. It's not even a yearly contract. Month-to-month. -month. I read the prospectus over and over again. I kept couldn't get a hold of him. The guy was in no, Salt Lake City or something on business, and he, we finally got a hold of him. Auntie did the review of the uh, the analysis for me, and he said, "I think this is a misprint because this was like a, a proof of the, of the of the prospectus. It can't be a month-to-month. -month. It must be year-to-year -year or something." When I talk, no, it's a month to month. They can cancel with 30 days notice. A company like Simmons can cancel with one minute notice. I don't remember, but we can find out. But he went public, and he uh, he turned his little company. They lost $300,000 the last fiscal year, and he turned his little company into a 10 or 12, no, a 15 million market cap, 15 million dollar market cap, and he owned 60 percent of the stock. And uh, I couldn't believe he did it, but that's why I knew we, pardon? How much did he raise? We see, um, they sold 25% of the company for, what's 25% of, no, they sold 40% of the company, 40% of 15 million, what's that? Enough. Six million? He raised six million dollars. Okay. Um, what's the question? Well, you, you asked the question, how, how large does the company have to be to go public? One of the, um, <clears throat> one of the, the firms that designs all my restaurants, um, I heard they were designing a restaurant uh, up in Universal Studios, and it was going public. And it was the highest, it went public, and it was uh, one of the, the, the stocks that went up the most in the restaurant industry last year. It's called Country Star. The guys that founded this restaurant had never been in the restaurant business. Good. Had never opened a restaurant. They went and they got Morgan Stanley or somebody back east. They sold them on an idea for a restaurant concept. And they gave equity away. 
They gave <laughs> they gave ten percent to uh, country stars. It was it was modeled after Hard Rock Cafe. I'm Hard Rock Cafe. They just opened in Universal Studios at City Walk. I don't know the end of the summer, but. He generated seven million dollars and fifteen or twenty million dollars in warrants with no experience, and I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> because I've been in the business years twenty experience. years, and the guy never—he'd never run a restaurant before. Do you believe it now? Why? Well, yeah, I do. <laughs> Should venture with him. Yeah. And, <laughs> I mean, he took this designer that worked for me back to New York, and they put the charts up, and and they and and these guys all sat in a the room. They said. We can sell that. And they That's did. all it takes. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Idea of five minutes before everybody else, and it's such a great concept when you go to the restaurant and you're familiar with that whole genre, Plant Hollywood and Hard Rock Cafe. It just made sense that with all the country music fans, they'd go to a restaurant like this. So now I understand they're expanding to Las Vegas and all of those cities. The idea was good enough so that it, I, I'm not surprised that they could raise that much money with no experience at it. Just like when I took an option public, you know, the, uh, hundreds of people came in after me. But I mean, I had no experience. These guys have no experience. See, you don't have to have experience. You don't have to be ready. These guys were obviously promoters. They were comfortable. I mean, that, that, I mean that, that, you know, rightly or wrongly, that validates what I'm talking about. And, and somebody, like I said, some doofus in the world will... Morgan Stanley knows nothing about restaurants. You know, that's why, I, I mean, I get excited when I hear Morgan Stanley in the room. I mean, I start salivating. They got those moron Ivy League MBAs in there. Sherry Wright, the Morgan Stanley guys, I mean, I would rather be across the table from them than anybody. The ones I don't want to be across from are those hard from Bear Stearns, where I came out of. I mean, I mean, these guys... I mean, you don't want to be across the table from them. You want to get up and leave. You want to see those white shoe Ivy League guys, you know, all puffed up. So then you can just peel them like a banana. <laughs> Any problem solved will be replaced immediately by a larger, more complicated one. If you are not having to deal with challenges, problems that are bigger than the ones you just solved, then you're not growing geometrically. And never, it's never a time to count your victories. It's only a time to count the opportunities that you have yet to encounter. As Jonah Salk, this is what I tell Lorraine, Lorraine doesn't like this. As Jonah Salk said, the reward for work well done is merely the opportunity to do more. That's the, all the thanks you get the opportunity to do more work. You like that one, didn't you, John? Jim, John's blanching up here. <laughs> the reward for work well done is the opportunity to do more work. Okay, now, you have in your packet a red flag investment checklist. Okay, while you're looking for that, somebody placed an article up here. Um, I don't know if it was Jim. This, an article, is this from the journal? Yeah. From the Wall Street Journal, today's journal, and the uh, title of the article is Golden Touch. New entrepreneurs offer a simple lesson in building a fortune. What do new, what do new super rich have in common? Guts and ideas of convenience. And it gives examples, three or four examples. How guys with no experience that were basically morons made, oh, we have five examples. I'll transport it on my way. I just have to ask you, the guy who raised six million bucks only had one deal with one company, that Simmons, that recharging, that... Oh, no, he, uh, uh, he had a half a dozen little regional month-to-month uh, -month contracts here in, the, here in the Valley. In the San Fernando Valley, he had one deal with Simmons. And that was the big That's one. That's it. Month-to-month. -month. I feel good. Yeah, month to month. And I, and I told him he'd never get it off the ground. Because, I mean, based on my background, I said, anybody, nobody's going to buy this. And it was done by a company, I thought it was Barclays Bank out of New York, but this is Barclays Investment House out of Philadelphia. 
which is a one office shop, probably got nine guys in it, I've never been there. And it was uh, also co-underwritten by a, a little group out of Salona Beach. Where the hell is Salona Beach? Okay. Now, the amount of investment firms that's... Pardon? The card, okay. Well, the amount of investment houses in, in, in Salona Beach, you got to be zero. I mean, qual I mean, it is, that's who the co-underwrote it, and they raised the guy six million bucks. Hmm. Sure you can't see me earlier tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to go through the checklist. Uh, uh, Lorraine's going to be copying I don't know what happened here. A little glitch. Okay. If you use this, now, see, I know it by, by heart. I mean, I don't have to use the list anymore, but I mean, and the things that we've already covered, if you follow this diligently, it'll preclude you from uh, uh, making a lot of mistakes. Investigate before you invest. Stick to your knitting. Stay laser beam focused. When you're working on a deal, ladies and gentlemen, be it a contract or whatever, you stay on that deal till it lives or dies until the baby's dead or until it's burping. You don't get off on willy-nilly on something else. Now, I can do get off willy-nilly because I've got eight or ten people to do these things for me. If it was just me, I can't do that. You, one thing at a time. Plan well, but then implement and execute. Avert avoidable mistakes. Forget about that which you cannot change. Seek advice of those whom you respect. That's your mentors. Dedicate yourself, dedicate yourself, dedicate yourself. And in the words of Winston Churchill, commencement speech, 1946 or 47, Cambridge University, shortest commencement speech on record. He got up, supposedly juiced up to the gills, with a big cigar in his mouth, and I normally smoke cigars and because I'm a kinder, gentler guy now. I'm not smoking cigars, and you notice that? Yeah, I'd be blowing smoke right in your hair so you smell like a... <laughs> <laughs> and he said, never, ever, 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 ever quit. Thank you very much. <laughs> and he walked back down and collapsed into his chair. Never, never, ever, ever quit. Now, this is the checklist for one to investigate prospective business associations. Base your search on information you have, voters, records, lawsuits, criminal convictions, and all these things can be done fairly easily. I personally have never done them myself. I've always hired somebody to do them, but I mean, you can do them yourself by going to the library. I think, it do isn't it the library? <laughs> Kathleen, is that you? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can get on that or online then. Okay. Is this stuff that's printed someplace? Yeah, we're giving it to you. She's going up. Oh. She's going to get it right now because somehow it didn't get in your packet. <laughs> best laid plans. Remember I said? Best laid plans. Okay, check both the individual name and the company name when you're doing your searches. Company, special licensing, like if you're a real estate broker, mortgage broker, whatever you need special licensing for. The schools they went to, property guarantor, T guarantor records. When I'm looking to hire somebody or I'm looking to go into a joint venture with them or a business relationship, if I, when I go through find, doing the due diligence on them, if I find one mistake on their resume or CV, that's it. There is no relationship. I'm very careful to say I graduated on the dean's list at undergraduate school. I didn't graduate with honors. I used to put honors down because I was on the dean list, but I didn't graduate with honors. I wasn't magna cum laude or summa cum laude. And so uh, if you put down you went to Harvard, you better, when I, we call Harvard, or you, you, know, you say you were at Oxford, I've been at Oxford, I walked across the Oxford campus. But I mean, you better have gone to Oxford. They better have your miserable, miserable name on some diploma there someplace. And if you, if you, if you allude and you say, you know, like there's an MBA executive course and there's a five-week or nine-week course at Harvard where you get some kind of doofus certificate, you better make sure I understand it's that doofus certificate, not an MBA from Harvard. And I mean, 
and uh, because to me that is a show of integrity. It's also a show that you lack self-confidence in yourself because you're not, you have to make up things about yourself. And I just won't do business with anybody <coughs> that falls into that category. That's a personal thing. It may, it, not necessarily, I can't speak from the mouth for the South and all these other guys, but I can tell you for me, each party, now we're talking about external growth still, remember? And that's why we had the checklist up there. Now, in external growth is going to be the active acquisitions. And in acquisitions, you're going to have to learn to negotiate if you don't already. You know, some of you in the room probably already think you know how to negotiate. Um, and each party to every negotiation has a comfort zone. The effective negotiator is one who can define the boundaries of the other party's zone and place the deal at the boundary nearest to its own interests. Now, in your cases, almost under any circumstances, it's better to give on a negotiation and get the deal done than to get the best deal you can. And um, because, i.e., you know, when you're negotiating with a bank, yeah, we, the next sheets, the other following sheets are coming. If you're negotiating with a bank, I mean, the difference between one over prime and three over prime is nothing. You just get the deal done, just get the money. My, my theory in, in building a company has always been just get the money. Under any circumstances, just get the money. No matter what it costs, just get the money. Like a broken record, no matter what it costs, just get the money. Just get the money. <laughs> and make the fees continue with, with your lawyers and accountants contingent on them making sure you get the money. Just get the money, just get the money. I mean, you never see in all these uh, big uh, transactions, uh, they never say that they're paying one half under prime, one over prime. They never listen to the interest rate, do they? Because nobody cares. Just get the money. Just get the money. Nobody cares because it's not important. As my grandmother, who's uh, in expiring right now at the age of 92, would say, because it's, uh, it's only a little bit important. It's only a little bit important, which means it's not important at all. It's not important. And only little people worry about things that are a little bit important. And when you're a little person that worries about little things that are only a little bit important, you stay a little person. And that's not what the seminar is all about. The seminar is all about growing exponentially and hunting with the big dogs. And for those of you that are from the South or any of those areas, you better appreciate hunting with the big dogs, what that means. What did you say, pee in the what yesterday? Pee in the tall grass of the big dogs. Yeah, pee in the tall grass of the big dogs. I like that. Yeah, yeah pee in the tall grass. My housekeeper, who's a black woman, um, Ruth Brooks, who uh, is from North Carolina, and, and she picked tobacco. And she says, these, you know, these, these kids, these also rans that pick cotton, that ain't nothing. They're picking tobacco. And uh, her husband died during the Vietnam War, and she's put three girls through school through graduate school at USC. I think one's a dentist, one's a teacher, and one is the A to uh, Janet Reno at um, uh, whatever the hell Janet Reno does, uh, Attorney General. <laughs> and uh, the yeah, that's right, man. And she says, she says, when I used to have my young students over and when the, when the, when the young uh, kids have come over to visit me, she doesn't like kids much because they all wants to get paid and nobody wants to work anymore, Mr. Now, I still haven't forgot that question you're going to answer, you know. I probably let your lunch settle too much before you're going to toss it up on the table now, but... The dark side of equity financing. If you're going to have external growth and you're going to use other people's money, or you're going to use the bank's money, there's a dark side to that. If Craig Hoffman took his operation public, which he's, uh, although, uh, you know, a lot of smaller operations have been taken public than his, probably at some point in time, he'd lose control of the company and he'd get ousted out, thrown out on his ass. That's just, you know, a matter of life. That's not saying anything about his management skills, it's not saying anything about anything. But that's just what happens. That's why a lot of guys don't go public. Because, you know, what am I going to do? And I took the attitude, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count all the money I got. And I'll spend the rest of my life counting all my money. Now, but you have to realize that. 
when you take in equity partners, that's a possibility because people that put up money will not allow you to st stick around when, once you've re reached your Peter Principle. Peter Principle meaning the maximum that you can do. <laughs> because they're there, they're there to make money. They're not there for you to fulfill your life's dream. They're there to get a return on your money. And Rick Scott is a preeminent ender of life dream thoughts for other people. <laughs> Believe me. I mean, Rick is very, very, you know, matter of fact, very bright guy. And I'm, I'm told he's, he's gotten to be a very good manager. I, I didn't know him as a manager, but. So you've got to understand that with that money that you want more than life, comes there's another side everything's got a, is, is a two-edged sword there's another side of it so there is a dark side to the equity financing and um, once you accept that idea that I would rather be a, a large part of a hundred million dollar company than all of a five or ten million dollar company it's it's easy to deal with until they throw you out then it becomes a little more difficult to deal with but, but you then you got the money then you just yeah, that's right you count the money Whenever I feel bad, I stand on my wallet. You know? Whenever I feel bad, I stand on my wallet. It makes me feel better right away. That's right. Okay, now, managing growth and preparing for diversification. Big dreams, big problems, big rewards. Now, this is kind of a summary of a lot of the things that we talked about. Okay, closing the deal. If you're not ready to die, then you can't be ready to live. If you're not ready to do everything humanly possible short of dying, then the chances of the deal coming to fruition are just diminished greatly. You want to simulate success. That's how you attract the big boys. By simulating success, remember you only have one time to make a first impression. By acting successful, by hanging around with the big dogs, peeing in the tall grass, I mean, those are where you pick up the traits, the characteristics of high-performance, super successful people. The thing you've got to understand, you don't have to hit a home run every time you're at the plate, but you do have to swing. You can't just let the fastballs zip by you. You've got to swing. Sometimes you'll strike out, sometimes you'll hit a base hit or a double or a triple, and sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll knock it over the fence. Now, the way you position yourself for a grand slam only comes with experience. I know that fire resources and the thing that the Mosby's are running for me is an opportunity for a grand slam. I know that easily fire resources can have a, um, in the billions of dollars market capitalization. I know that. I didn't need to have to crunch any numbers. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to do any of those things because when DuPont has spent, has two plants that each cost them three or four hundred million dollars to, to, uh, to uh, build, that just make Nomex, which is the, the competing product, and they've had a lock on the product since the early 60s, and they've said that we will viciously defend our market share, and they've done everything humanly possible to keep everybody else out of the business for 25 years, I know <coughs> There's a big pot of gold there. <coughs> I know that. I don't need. I don't need uh, anybody to crunch any one, two lotus, one, two threes for me. And that's why, when I settled up with Great Western, in addition to the cash I got, I took that patent, that oven, that special oven that we made in in Italy, and and I, I'm willing to fund it myself. Yet I'm still giving away equity. I'm sure I could find people to run it that I don't, I, and other people, I don't have to give away anything. I'm sure, I'm positive, I could find some guys from the, the textile industry. But I'm not doing that. Now, why would I do that when all my, well, not all, but most of my adult career in business, I've done it the other way successfully. Now, why, some people would say, well, because you may be, maybe you're, there are going to be billions of dollars, and, you know, for every point you're giving away is $100 million or... You know, I haven't really run those numbers. I, maybe the Mosby's have. I, they, yeah, they're shaking their head. Yeah, they have. I haven't run those numbers, so I don't know. You can ask Jim at the break what the, what the numbers break down. But I mean, one or five percent or whatever is a lot of money. 
and I could easily talk myself out of doing that. But I haven't, because I know, and the reason I don't even think about it is because I don't want to even for a moment put myself in the position of second-guessing myself. I'd be a fool to start using a different formula now after all the successes I've had. I mean, uh, I'd be crazy. And I've been called a lot of things in my life, but one of them's not crazy. Okay. Track record of deals. Other people's money. The best way for most of you to get within your comfort zone so you don't throw up when you do some of these things is on the back of somebody else for the first few times. Join up with somebody that's either got the expertise and or the money. Smart people that have the expertise, like myself, will say, fine, you can find the money. I'll give you the expertise. Because you'll be a better business person, you'll be more effective once you've scraped around on your belly, licking the boots of 50 or 100 financial institutions. And then that way, then you can train somebody like I train people now. Because just because I'm telling you how to do it, until you've done it, you can't train anybody. And we've got one of the big time trainers in the United States sitting here, and I think he would agree with that. Until you've done it yourself, you can't train anybody. We've talked a lot about, about being ready for success versus being comfortable. You're never ready. Kirk Gibson wasn't ready to hit that home run in the Dodgers' uh, 88 or 89 World Series uh, triumph. He was comfortable. He said, I got one good swing in me. It's being comfortable that you're going to be able to perform. It's the comfort level that the people that work with you, that you're not going to eat their head off when they do something wrong, that will allow them to make those judgments, those decisions to carry you to the next level. The Mosby's met with uh, Luda Weasel this morning, and I mean, he was a formidable opponent. Smart, slippery guy. A lot of success in business. And I sent him into the breach like the Christians to the lions. And they did good. They did good. Good's a relative term, but <laughs> they did good. They did good. They didn't sign over any stock to him. They didn't give him any money. So they did good. But I mean, it's the comfort. It's not the readiness. Staying on track, the outcome, this is, uh, this is important, outcome equals commitment plus or minus measurement plus or minus modification. Your outcome that you're looking for is your commitment plus or minus measurement plus or minus modification because you have to continue to modify the things you do. You've been given, the, I think, the red flag check, checklist a little late, but you've been given it for investing. And we've talked about dealing with the dark side. When they come, they come at what you love. For some of you, to lose control of the company that you've run 10 or 20 years, in theory, could be devastating. Because some people, their whole self-worth, their whole basis for self-esteem evolves around their work. That's why people don't turn loose their sense of self-esteem is directly related to what they do. And if they give away what they do, they give away their self-esteem. When they really should think about, when you give away self-esteem, you build self-esteem. Don't overlook the obvious and why any challenge resolved should be replaced by a much larger challenge and a more complicated one, otherwise you're not growing. Like uh, somebody, Leanne will uh, call me from Houston or send me a fax and she'll say, we must be making a lot of progress because we have problems. We must be growing geometrically this week because, boy, we're in the middle of a pile of shit. I say, yeah, yeah. And, it, and as she said, she's talked to a couple of the uh, seminars. That's a couple of the seminars because she's been there. And she says, 
the blacker things get, because normally people would ask Leanne, or I don't know if they've asked Lorraine, I'm not asking Lorraine to comment on this, is he really like this, is this how it really is, blah, 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 and they ask my, well, questions of my wife the same. But, but Leanne would tell you, the blacker it gets, the crappier it gets, the nastier it gets, the more pessimistic the set of circumstances that I'm involved in, the happier I am. And the reason I like that is because from chaos I know comes order and with order comes a lot of money. And I've never made a lot, a lot of money without a lot, a lot of problems. So if I'm not having any problems, then I know I'm not going to make any money. And if I'm not going to make any money, I'd rather be playing golf with Hoffman or something, you know. So I, when we don't have a lot of problems, then that means I'm not doing anything. Just the contrary to the conventional wisdom that you've been taught, you've been brought up in. Anybody have any questions on this? Because this is a, a, a summary of, of sorts. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very small step from the limo to the gutter. <laughs> yeah, it's a very small step. And it's a big step from the gutter to the limo. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When I park cars when I was going to high school, I used to park cars at a place called the Pump Room on Ventura Boulevard, Studio City. And when they parked a car in those days, a big tipper would give you a dollar to park his car. And, and, and uh, most people gave you nothing. And maybe they give you the change in their pocket, a quarter, 50 cents. I look at people that park cars today, and I see the money. You realize, now, this, when I was in high school, that was over 30 years ago. People still give a dollar. Yeah, I mean, and, and people still, some people still don't give anything. When I'm in Century City in the Twin Towers, they fight to park my car. I mean, and no, they don't want to drive the Cobra. When I pull up in a Cobra, they say, Mr. Penny, can you, you park right here in front? Because they don't, they're afraid to drive it because if they hurt it or something. But they fight because, you know, I get $5 or whatever, you know, I don't, I just give them some because I, you know, one, I used to park cars just like I used to be a caddy. You know, and, and, the, and uh, I used to caddy for Alice Marble, the U.S. 1946 or 48 U.S. Open uh, tennis women's champion. And I used to carry, you schlep the bags along, you know, and um, they used to pay $6 for a single in those days and $12 for a double. Six, and they didn't have those light bags. These were those big Neanderthal, like I've got these big Neanderthal bags. And I'd be... <laughs> <laughs> like a coolie. <laughs> and my, my son is in a theater group, but the Will Greer Theater Group today, in fact, my wife should be here pretty soon, maybe she'll bring my son. Uh, Will Greer was the guy that played on the Waltons, the grandpa, when he left a lot of money when he died to the, forming the Will Greer Theater Group in Topanga Canyon. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, my son is a part of that group. My, my son is directing Shakespeare. He's 12 years old. <clears throat> and the, uh, he's, you know, he's, he thinks he's Lord Olivier already. And the, uh, which is good. That's good, you know. It's better than him thinking he's not. And so, uh, but um, the, uh, he has no concept of getting a job when he's 12 years old. You know. The, it's different, it, you know, it's a different different life, different generation. It's wise to keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that no success or failure is necessarily final. It's necessarily final. Whether you been, haven't been successful to this date doesn't mean it's forever. And to the extent that you've been successful to this date doesn't mean that's forever. I, I'm, I get excited when I find somebody who's like a medical doctor who's going to go out and do something else. You know, that's, I think that's great. That's because he has, he's been a medical doctor a while. It's not like he just got out of his internship. I, I do believe him unless my eyes are failing me. <laughs> yeah. And, but I mean, that's great. Looking for new challenges. You know? Most people in this room, if they were, you know, 
notwithstanding the way the laws have changed in medical insurance and said, you know, you doctor, you doctor for life. Creating your exit strategy. Now, before we get into this, we're going to go around. Remember the question I asked earlier? What was the question? What were we going to do with what we're going to do? Does this apply to me? No. <laughs> no. What, what do we have to do? <laughs> to what? To, yeah, to, to, to go on with our plan, with what we learned here. What price are you willing to pay? Pay. Very good. Okay. What price? What price does the, the um, make your stomach turn up inside you? At what price? We're going to start at the back of the room. Burl, what price are you willing to pay? And she's already made about, you know, a, a quantum leap. Mike. Oh, the mic, the mic. mic. It's right there. There is no price that's too high. Ooh, I like that answer. Give her a gun, then. Give her a gun. That's good. I could probably use it. I, yeah, I, I know. Uh, that's, I was making a joke, bro. You didn't have to tell everybody <laughs> in the whole room. You know? <laughs> okay. And okay, whatever, okay, uh, no price too high, right? Okay, next. And I don't want the bullshit answer that the answer that, you know, that do you, because uh, I know she meant what she said. I want the real answer. You notice he puts in the bullshit caveat before it gets to me. Um. <laughs> Can I have some of my blankets? <laughs> I think the scariest thing for me at this point right now, and that's the question, right? What would you not want to do? And therefore, what are you prepared to do? Um, is to take this job, this radio show job, and, uh, and be prepared to quit. Outright leave, quit that job. Because tomorrow morning, when two million people read that paper, including Geffen and Spielberg and everybody else, my boss is not going to like me very much on Monday morning. Because if today... I'm talking about your exit strategy a little early then. <laughs> if today what he's paying me isn't enough, then by Monday it certainly isn't enough. But it doesn't matter what the morons say. You already told me your boss is a moron. Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, okay, I mean... <laughs> but the, the price would be to, uh, in a very un-Mexican way, okay... Uh, to in a very a way that you never tell your Mexican grandmother about quit a job that has elevated you to this point in a very irrational way so and, and to be jobless for you know two hours two years whatever closer to two hours and two years I'm sure but you're right that that's the um Quit successful job. Okay, next. Uh, with my new position, uh, my whole... He's the guy that chased this guy down like a dog <laughs> all over the place and wore him down into hiring him, basically. Right? Exactly. Okay. Um, I make a whopping uh, $500 a week, which I can't live on, so my balls are to the wall, and uh, I have to perform to, to exist. So... Um, without performance and without saying what I do that I, if I don't perform or don't do what I said I can do, uh, I'm looking for another job. So you're going to have to perform? Whatever it takes. Above and beyond. Legally or illegally. Yeah. Perform at whatever it takes is a good answer almost for anybody in this room. But he, he quantified his. Next, please. 
Well, in my company, I'm already one of the top producers, so my intention is to be the top producer. In order to do that, I'm going to continue getting up at uh, 4 or 5 in the morning and going to bed at uh, 1, 2 in the morning. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. What I really have is a list of intentions that are very, very uh, well honed, laser beamed focus, and uh, my intention is to do whatever it takes to realize those. And that changes from day to day. So it's actually being able to be creative daily, creative in the moment, and uh, flexible as well as focused. Okay. I can't focus. I can't spell focus. They're focused. Shit. Yeah, focused. We're going to abbreviate whatever. W-E-I-T. So I don't keep writing it. Okay. Jim. I think mine's, uh, you know, basically there is no price that's too high short of you know, maybe killing my daughter. Notice I didn't say spouse, but um, I don't really <laughs> I knew think... I I loved that kid as soon as I saw him. I don't think there is a price that we can, that I could put up there. Well, if the first four guys are anywhere reasonably close to being accurate to what they're willing to do, I will make a guarantee, this is the third guarantee I've made here today, or in the last three days, that they'll succeed beyond their, their wildest dreams. I mean, I, I can tell you that. The only caveat is if they really are sincerely mean it, because as, as Charles Schwab said in one of the slides, any, almost anything's impossible. Almost anything's possible with unlimited enthusiasm, and that's true. I mean, because Charles Schwab's not that smart either. He's a, a enthusiastic, energetic, passionate guy, though. Yes. I think about a month ago, I already paid that price uh, because I felt that it was important for me to to leave my job, and by doing that, I was basically putting everything on the line. Uh, my whole career behind me and pursue something that I was passionate about and as of yesterday uh, I've already taken my quantum leap by making that decision and uh, as a result of this I think what I learned was I needed to stretch myself to be more uncomfortable rather than comfortable and uh, and make bigger decisions because I've always previously made decisions that were comfortable and easy Almost everybody does. Because of the preconditioning that we've all unfortunately been put through by our families, uh, you know, uh, more specifically our parents, um, we've learned to take the easy way out. And that's why when Napoleon Hill says people are like rivers, you know, and they meander and they take, the, you know, they're all crooked because they take the easy way out. A river meanders to where the ground's the softest or lowest. And there's nothing wrong with that. There is something wrong. Let me take that back. There's something wrong with it until you've been informed what it is. There's nothing wrong with it or a little wrong with it until somebody tells you. See, you're armed with a lot of knowledge. And one of which is if you really start to act like you don't give a shit what anybody thinks of you, that alone, you'll make so much money you won't be able to count it. I mean, Donald Trump takes pride on people not liking him. I, I can't begin to tell you how you're empowered over your competition, over your fellow worker, over your colleague. And again, I'm not talking about doing it in an unprofessional, uh, seemingly ruthless manner. I mean, because you can just listen to, you know, that's fine, but uh, in, in one ear and I, you know, just like, like you do your spouse, you know, it goes in one ear and just floats through your empty head into the other, I'll, you know how you do with your, you know, your children do to you? That's all I'm asking you to do, I'm not asking you to be a shithead or anything. Oh yeah, yeah, honey, sure. And just go on and take care of business. I mean, that's not so bad, I mean, you do it every day anyway. Yeah, it's more fun, more fun being a shithead, he says. Okay, next. 
Doc, what do you got to say? <laughs> right now, I'm not really working on anything, but um, once I find something that I can feel the real passion for, I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. That's an excellent point. Unless you feel the passion, don't be wasting a lot of effort on these things. That's an excellent point. You may not find, you may already have found it. You may not find it for a week, a month. But don't be doing all these things until you find that thing that you can be passionate about. That's a good point. Sir. Well, before I got here three days ago, I thought that I was willing to do whatever it takes. I proved it over the last year. Now I know without a question of a doubt <coughs> that I'm willing to do whatever it takes. My wife uh, validated that last night. She joined me after my first two days here. She said, it's scary. You're almost cold. And I was. I mean, I, I don't want to associate. I've been getting that way anyhow. It wasn't just from these two days, but they, they finished it. They really did. Well, if, to, if these three days don't put a stake in the heart of your, <laughs> of your w w wussy, uh, wimpish did. attitudes about business, because it's a jungle out there, and all these airy fairy guys that run around and say it's not haven't made any money. I mean, these guys that I've alluded to for the last two and a half days are assassins. These guys would rip your heart out and use your rib cage platter. And the two or three successful businesswomen I know are even worse. And I mean, this balanced life, airy, fairy, car to buy the sea just is not possible. Just isn't. So that's good. I appreciate, I appreciate everything. Good, thank you. Bruce. Anything as long as it's uh, legal, ethical, and moral, starting with uh, ending the relationship we've talked about as soon as, as soon as I humanly can. He sent me a little note of these five things he wanted to do, and the note, I read it, uh, I forget, either last night or this morning, and he said it was on the back of a five credo card, <laughs> and it was um, to grow the business, uh, I think, 100 billion in revenue, 30 billion in assets, or something like that, and, and end a relationship with a, uh, with a business associate, and, uh, and do whatever it takes, and the, as soon as you possibly can. And uh, because it's easy, especially real hard decisions, it's always easy to procrastinate about. It's, my, it's very easy to get wishy-washy. And, uh, and that's human nature. Again, it's our preconditioning, you know. The, um, it, it often amazes me how anybody can winds up being successful with the training that we get from our parents and, and schools. I mean, it just it, it boggles my mind that anybody ever gets to be anything. Uh, and the... Uh, I asked the, uh, asked the question, or somebody asked me about leadership classes in college. Now, some of the better B schools do have leadership classes, uh, and, um, and so, and, but most of them don't, as far as I know. I think the Kennedy School uh, does, and I think maybe uh, Wharton does, and a couple, half a dozen others, maybe, maybe Stanford does. I don't think Anderson does here at UCLA. But, um, when you've, when, you, when you've developed your leadership skills, that will automatically enhance your self-esteem <clears throat> and your ability to not be as concerned with what other people say. Norman Schwarzkopf, when he told them that they were going to attack Kuwait around the, the, going around the whole country and come in from, I believe, the north, northwest and have his uh, supply lines exp ex um, Dispersed, dispersed over 350 miles, which is, that's not the way you win wars. And, uh, I've been to Command and General Staff School, that's not the way you win wars. You keep your supplies tight behind you. You don't spread them out over 350 miles and so then get the hell knocked out of them. And all his Air Force people, all these guys that he had gone to school with and been con you know, on the Joint Chiefs Staff and known all these, they all told him he was nuts. But he said, it's either my way or the highway until the president relieves me, which I think he almost did. <laughs> the, and, but the leadership, you don't, you're not as concerned because 
you, you, you know you got to take the heat. And part of being a high performance person, ladies and gentlemen, is when things go wrong, all the heat falls on one person. That's another reason that there's so few high performance people because all this shit rolls downhill. Always have, always, always has, always will be. Always will, excuse me. You know, just that's why President Bush was, you know, he's a hero after the war, the uh, uh, Iraqi war, wasn't he? Because he got all the glory. If they, we had lost 300,000 guys and everything, boy, they would have impeached his ass. As it turns out, they might have well impeached him anyway because they threw his butt out because the economy, you know, he was, he was judged on his, his economic prowess, which maybe he doesn't have much of. It's lonely up there. Okay, next. Well, like Jay said, we do have a successful business. And I know that I'm ready to get rid of it if that's what it takes. Uh, my daughter called last night, and uh, I'm not going to get rid of Jay, but she, I, I told her that uh, we were going to start making money a different way, and she said, well, how? And I said, I don't know that, but I'm, I'm going to find out. And she said, well, has my dad woken up? And I said, yeah, he has. And what the next step is, I don't know, but I, I just know we're going to find a manager as soon as we're home and we're going to start something else. That's great. See, quantum thinking, they're going to start something else. You know, spin in a completely different direction. I mean, uh, well, she's sitting in the back now, but with the, the, the young lady that was sitting up here in front, I got to get out. I, there used to be a song, I got to get out of this place. <laughs> no matter what the hell, remember back in the 60s or 70s? I mean, and th sometimes, a lot of times, that's what it takes. And, it, I mean, if you're the most successful VR broker in the country five years in a row, not many, much place to go, <laughs> I mean, uh, at the very top. And uh, other than down, and, and uh, like when people used to say when we were the fastest growing uh, energy company five years in a row, I mean, where are you going to go? I said, well, we're going to be six years in a row. As it turned out, we weren't six years in a row. But no, that's good. Yes, sir. Well, on the first day, I said that I, I really had become aware of the need to, of the fuzziness of my own vision and the fuzziness of my focus. And uh, coming from the East Coast to the West Coast, of course, we've been waking up at 4.30 every morning. Uh, but this morning at, uh, at 4.30, I was tossing and turning in bed and uh, finally had to get up because it was just burning in my gut. And I went and sat, in the, uh, sat on the toilet um, with the seat down <laughs> with my notepad uh, and, and began writing down the things that I woke up uh, in, my, in my head and in my heart. And for me, I, the complacency is not there. Uh, for me, it's to stop caring about the morons, which uh, today I've already had several opportunities to uh, exercise <laughs> and uh, to keep the passion, uh, literally eat, sleep, and uh, uh, live, the, live that focus and keep the burn there. Uh, Telling my family and uh, taking the charge there, which I'm already doing because we're staying another day. D hey, honey, guess what? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> and on top of it, the uh, the, the gentleman from the the, the Legrand group, uh, uh, I'll probably be seeing every four to six weeks next year. And they're going to come and they're going to see me a week at the castle. And so they're going to be getting double, triple, quadruple doses. Yeah, and, and uh, the, um, but the replication, I mean, if you don't come back and hear me get around somebody that's a, that can be your mentor. I mean, Burl, this is the ninth or tenth, or I forget how many times Burl's been around. But um, the, uh, it's replication, I mean, you know. I'm not trying to sell all the crap in the back of the room, but I mean, I, will, I, I listen to my own tapes day after day after day. And it makes me cry still when I listen to them. <laughs> you know, I mean, 
And now my kids, I tell you, they go blank. They just, they just sit there like zombies, you know. And they because you know, and uh, but, but you know, like the big dogs thing. I've forgotten. I used to say that. I want to hunt with the, now I'm going to say in paw, pee in the tall grass. I like that. <laughs> hunt with the big dogs and pee in the tall grass. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Okay. Very good. Yes, sir. Well, I have no restrictions placed on me as far as, uh, uh, well, from any quarter, actually, as far as home or uh, family or, or uh, friends or uh, society in general is concerned. So I believe that we, even with a little conditioning, I could be ready for anything. And uh, he's, he's in, in a little while, but not just not right away, but within the, the next uh, week or two, three, four he, months. He, he said an important uh, word, conditioning. He understands how many years of conditioning he's had the other way. And and that's it's not impossible to get over that. But I mean, it, it, it can be a laborious task. And that's why. Like I tell my kids, when if I ever, you know, get sick or just put me down like the dog, I mean, because I don't, because when you don't keep your mind active, I mean, you you, you, you fall back into, it's like when I had a few drinks and I drive in, in, in the UK, I start driving on the wrong side because I learned how to drive on this side of the road. And I, I remember pulling out of the castle, the front gates one day, and Dan Jr. sitting there and we're going, I said I was going to take him to get a haircut or something, and I'm on the American side of the road. And, and uh, I don't like him to, I'm listening to my tapes. Now, now, I didn't have tape, these kind of tapes then. I was listening to somebody's tapes. I don't know whose tapes. And um, he keeps going, poking me. And I said, what's wrong? He finally screams out, Daddy, Daddy, we're on the wrong side of the road. We're going to hit the car. And I swerve over, you know. And you fall back. You fall back into your old conditioning very easily. You fall back into your own conditioning when you get around the people that you've been raised with, with the people that, you know, have been part of that conditioning process. And that's why 1984, God, my wife just walked in, she already walked out. She must have known I was gonna tell this story. That's why in 1984, I yanked my wife and got out of the country and went to Scotland. Because I, you know, if my kids were gonna be screwed up, we're gonna do it my way, not my parents' way or my grandparents' way. And um, to get away from that. And so there's going to be some difficult choices that you'll have to make to get away from that conditioning. And by the way, and I'm, and I'm not into the touchy-feely stuff, but I mean to the extent that you've made friends here and to the extent that you can stay in contact and continue to have intellectual, excuse me, dialogue and discourse, I would highly recommend it. And I'm not, you know, I don't put up the cards and all that bullshit like everybody does. You know, you know. I don't care if you, you know, I, uh, that's not what this is all about. Just like we don't get up and do jumping jacks and jump around and <laughs> jump. You know, you want to do jumping jacks, go in the parking lot. But no, no, no. That's right, the hot coals, yeah. But, but so, I mean, to the extent that you, you know, you've made some friends here, some acquaintances, I mean, I would highly recommend uh, that you, you talk and you exchange ideas so you can continue to replicate uh, your successes. Uh, and replicate between you and share successes. Yes. I'm going to uh, develop uh, one or two mentor relationships. I'm going to make a real effort to do that. And uh, probably the most difficult thing, and I'll probably do it gritting my teeth, is I'm <laughs> going to give some equity to some key people <laughs> in the company. That's good. I didn't tell you how much, but I'm going to give it So I'm going to be, see, because I see him a lot, I'll be able to prod him along a little, see, now that he's told me that. What do you mean you're only going to give him a half a percent? <laughs> Mr. Hoffman, the, drawing up the paperwork costs more than a half a percent's worth. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, sir. Um, the most difficult thing that I need to do and is uh and it would be my pay price to action i guess is is uh letting go 
um, it's it's going to be difficult. Um, we had a clue, though. This summer we went to Europe for three and a half weeks, and we left nobody in charge. We just left. People said, who's in charge? I said, nobody. I said, well, what's going to happen? I said, it'll take care of itself for three and a half weeks. And that was in August, and it, it's been our best month this year by 50%. <laughs> You know, that says it all. When I say the problem is, you know, you know, if you took off a year, what had happened? Off you, you know, I mean, that says it all. Hey, have we got? If you would, if you, if you could say that directly in front of the camera after this thing, because that says it all. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. We is the problem. And, and that's, that's, it, 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 not that I need it validated, but I like to hear it validated because I've done it so many times now, you know, but uh, that's exactly what Burl and a lot of these guys and gals over the last 15 months since I've been doing this, they can't believe it when it happens. Like the guy that we talked to, Casey, he, he couldn't believe that when he went away on, finally on his honeymoon and he came to the castle seminar on his honeymoon, they did more business than they ever had done before. We always thought it was coincidence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is, that's, that's timely. That's great. Doctor? Uh, doc, Dr. Abraham uh, uh, Maslow many years ago stated that you should change your career every 10 years and, uh, and to create the stimulus. Hierarchy of needs, by the way. Create the Maslow stimulus uh, in life, the joie de vivre to, to live. And uh, I'm willing to take that uh, paradigm shift and uh, change direction in my career, which is a well-established career, and to be able to move out of that into other areas. <coughs> uh, I have been committed to that before, uh, coming here, and even more so now. And, uh, of course, it makes it easier, the fact that my kids are growing up and I'm single. It uh, does make it easier, but nevertheless, I'm willing to make that commitment. I'd forgotten that Maslow uh, had said that. Uh, the hierarchy needs that he wrote about 30 years ago or thereabouts are what you what, what uh, a human being mankind needs and you know food shelters and, and uh, I forget what else sex uh, warmth uh, some other stuff but uh, that's right every 10 years well that's what about what I've done I was uh, 10 years on Wall Street 10 years in the energy business Linda you got your double espresso yeah, yeah. 10 years on uh, you know um, in Wall Street business uh, 10 years in the energy business and now I'm on my third 10 years. I hadn't really thought of it that way. But, um, and it's interesting, when I walked away from my Wall Street firm and when I walked away from the energy business, I never looked back. With all the success I had in both places, I never looked back and I just thought it was time for me to do something new. Yes? Yes, we've decided that um, we never had the fire go out. It just, it never even hit ember. But now we've had some serious petroleum products thrown on it. And we've got, I mean, it's a full roar now. Um, our, we're not complacent anymore. We're seeing where we have to go and what, what it has to take to do it. I kind of knew what I needed to do, but I found out that I really was too dependent on a lot of the things that we've discovered here that we need to cut and move on. And I don't have a problem doing that. And it's going to happen. It's just now dreaming the bigger dream and setting those goals that I won't achieve in a lifetime and using the laser beam focus and getting that passion to go and do it. Um, I don't see that being a problem. It's now, like um, Mr. Hoffman said, I've now decided to pick up on two more mentors to get me through and um, lean on, use. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Um, the only thing is now going ahead and doing it. I've got their names now. It's just like um, the Mosley brothers said, all I got to do is ask, and the worst they can say is no. Good. Yes, sir. Well, I paid a pay point to price to action to whatever several years ago when I walked out of a very successful job and started another small business. Uh, over the last two years, I sat up, and if you want to talk about pride of authorship, after two years, I've built the absolute bottom line best construction estimating program there is anywhere. 
And my big pay point right now is going to be to give up some equity to go get my dream team. I think some of that dream team is sitting here right now. But the one problem is, is they're all in a position of wanting to go out and find their own damn dream teams. <laughs> so I've got to figure out a way to go find a dream team and then figure out how to release that so that I've got 50% of something that's outstanding and, and, and has a huge growth potential as opposed to having 100% of something that I can't move because I don't know enough about it. I mean, I need the dream team bad.